Hi everyone, this is Toby from the International Association for Political Science Students. We are live here again from San Francisco at the annual convention of the International Studies Association. And I'm very happy to have next to me Gerald Schneider from the University of Constance. Welcome. Welcome. And um, you are presenting here uh, at ISA uh, this week on the Russia-EU sanctions. Um, what is your topic again? I mean, one of my research topics is economic interdependence and conflict this, uh, since a quite long time um, already. And then the uh, sanctions after the invasion in Crimea um, against um, Russia was just a natural uh, extension of this uh, long-held research topic uh, that I'm uh, conducting. Uh, and we have now quite interesting data about sanctions by the EU. Uh, in general, but also with regard to uh, Russia. So are you uh, comparing um, sanctions uh, between, like, EU sanctions on Russia over time, or do you have different uh, um, sanctioning programs between different countries? Uh, we uh, conduct uh, different kind of studies. The, the most general study is a comparison of sanctions by the EU with sanctions of the uh, United States, um, and we try to figure out uh, under what conditions uh, these sanctions are effective. and uh, the, Preliminary findings are that this, I think, is quite interesting that sanctions of the EU uh, are more effective than the ones of the United States. Uh, but obviously, the uh, United States has a um, better threat potential. So, uh, for the United States, quite often the threats are sufficient uh, to bringing uh, offending um, states to change their behavior. So. And then linked to that, we especially focus uh, on um, the sanctions against Russia. We look at uh, economic repercussions, I mean, how firms reacted to that, uh, what the business strategies uh, were, uh, how much uh, particular industries suffered uh, on the financial markets, but also how other industries have gained in value uh, linked um, to that. Um, the sanctions uh, against Russia in, are insofar special because they are uh, then also accompanied by counter sanctions, uh, which obviously limit somehow the uh, effectiveness. Um, but uh, still, we believe that uh, the sanctions are somehow effective uh, in the sense that. Uh, the situation would probably be much worse in case the sanctions were not um, then levied against Russia. Mm -hmm. I'm interested, what are the criteria, um, how do you conceptualize success and does it have an impact also that, that the EU and the US, for example, have different definitions of, of success in this regard for the outcome? You have to look at the, the goals of the sanctions. I mean, why uh, were sanctions um, imposed? And then you can uh, already figure out whether they have to do, for instance, with the human rights situations, whether the human rights situation remained at the same level or whether there was an improvement in, um, after the sanctions or the sanctions um, threats um, um, already. Um, the general perception of sanctions is quite a negative one, um, uh, but this is influenced by cases like Russia, Cuba, partly, uh, probably also in Iran, um, but there are many sanctions which have led to policy changes. So one has to look at the conditions under which these sanctions um, are um, then imposed against uh, specific um, uh, states. So you can look at outcome variables, there are different uh, conceptualizations of sanctions and uh, also on sanctions effectiveness where one then has students basically making judgments on how effective uh, they have been. Uh, one of the goals is also to compare um, actually these more objective measures with the subjective assessments that have been um, made. Yeah. Um, before moving to my next question, I also want to encourage you, of course, um, watching there from home to ask your questions, of course. If you have any, please feel free to raise them. Um, I'm, I'm getting curious about um, whether the, the way sanctions work and the way um, how successful sanctions are, especially between the EU and Russia, whether the character uh, and the indicators change um, or have changed since the end of the Cold War, um, observing that the relationship between those two agents uh, differs. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, things we have to look at there? 
Uh, I mean, the basic understanding of sanctions is heavily influenced by the work of Thomas Schelling uh, of the 1960s and uh, late 1950s. He's one of my intellectual uh, heroes, and he distinguished between deterrence and compellence. Um, deterrence being the less active strategy, you try just to prevent something, and compellence, you try to force uh, the, uh, the target of a sanction to change its behavior. Um, and uh, we uh, then examine uh, this uh, very closely and what we uh, obviously follow here is in the footsteps of Schelling, uh, we apply then um, a deterrence uh, model or uh, how is it also called the crisis bargaining uh, model. So there are game theoretic foundations for that. Um, some people in the literature question whether uh, you can really uh, use this methodology here, whether sanctions are not, they're not really more of kind of uh, cheap talk. Hmm? So, so the signals are not as strong as when you have a real military uh, confrontation, but I still think it's the most uh, logic um, approach to start with. It's a strategic interaction. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us something about uh, the perception also of a, of a successful um, of a successful sanction when it comes to the portrayal in domestic policies. So for example, in the U.S., you have a very strong um, notion of a successful sanction being a strong sanction, um, at least when it comes to, to public discourses. How, how does that make a difference? Uh, obviously, politicians have to sell uh, sanctions uh, to uh, their uh, audiences, um, and it's obviously then quite often quite difficult to sell a sanctions against uh, Cuba, for instance, which go on and on for years. And these sanctions have contributed to the bad image uh, sanctions um, have um, in uh, general. But when you take the, the sanctions against Iran, uh, they were considered in the West, uh, with the exception of um, uh, parts of the Republican Party in the US, were considered to be quite uh, successful. And I uh, agree with that, that what doesn't make uh, the current regime in um, Tehran a better uh, place or a better regime. So, but uh, the most observers believe that these um, are successful sanctions in the sense that some of the conditions set forth by the Western Alliance have been met by uh, Tehran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's get closer a bit to the topic of your presentation and talk about the let's talk about the winners and the losers yeah. uh, in this in this sanction game. Um, I know that you're still having this uh, research project uh, going on, but, yeah. but what are the results that are already uh, clear at this point? Uh, I mean, uh, what we do, and this is uh, one of the first studies in this respect, we look at the financial market reactions. Mm -hmm. I'm somehow obsessed uh, always by the question on who are the winners and the losers of a particular um, action. Uh, obviously, sanctions hurt both the sender of the sanctions and the target, but mm -hmm. um, since the economy uh, suffers um, on the that then, or certain parts of it more, then you also might have winners. So with regard to uh, German industry, uh, you would expect that the energy sector uh, profits somehow, at least the firms um, uh, who then can offer an alternative to uh, Russian uh, gas uh, being imported to uh, Western Europe. And the losers are uh, the producers of military equipment um, or the specific uh, 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 products have been targeted, dual use products, um, for instance, that's the, also the automobile sector. Um, um, so, what we find is that when you look at the different episodes in the confrontation, mm -hmm. that some uh, episodes there was a clear effect. So, these firms were losing. Uh, in value, uh, so investors moved away from these particular assets uh, and then on the, the winner's side, um, also for some episodes, there were effects, but not for other um, of these episodes, because you always have to think in terms of the anticipation of what happens. So mm -hmm. when um, Russia invaded Crimea, it was clear uh, that the West would follow up with sanctions. The question was then whether the sanctions are severe. So market participants uh, anticipate then uh, certain 
um, reactions uh, and sometimes you see no reaction on the financial market because it's already priced in beforehand because exactly these sanctions then uh, happened. We can partly control for these anticipatory uh, effects, um, but I mean, you do not get these clear cut uh, results. And that's also, I mean, I'm a quantitatively oriented scholar, but here you have something very qualitative then to judge on why uh, you have these effects for one episode, but not for another mm -hmm. episode. Yeah. Um, how how does the geopolitics make it make a difference here? Because you have the EU also being closer to Russia, for example, than than the US, and so dependency is also another variable uh, that, that comes. This, uh, this uh, certainly uh, plays a role when you look at uh, sanctions, uh, and there is an important uh, paper by two American colleagues published um, uh, three years ago in International Organization where they clearly show that they are curve linear. Mm -hmm. uh, relationship. So um, when you are only weakly interdependent with the uh, economy of the potential target, then you might raise um, a sanction or threaten the other side. Um, and then uh, when you are becoming more independent, then you go down with the likelihood mm -hmm. that you uh, impose a sanction or threaten with a sanction. But then at a certain level, uh, and you're heavily exposed to this state and uh, also the behavior is then quite severe from the other side. You have no way then to uh, impose a sanction. This was exactly the situation in which Europe found uh, itself and also uh, now the United States, but first the United States obviously it has now also another dimension built, which is um, to some extent domestic. I mean, obviously, I mean the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. As we have um, a lot of young students uh, visiting here uh, and um, watching our uh, our video. Um, I wonder, can you tell us a bit about how your personal motivation plays into this this research? So is there, when was the point you said, okay, this, this is something we really need to understand better or um, is it more uh, something that you said um, uh, that, that politicians are uh, need better advice when it comes to sanctions, that there is not enough know-how, or where, where does that come from? Uh, I, mean, I think you can only be a successful academic if you are sufficiently intrinsically motivated okay. in finding out something about the process in which you are interested. Mm -hmm. um, I have the privilege of being uh, now a professor for quite a long time, and this means that I can select my research okay. topics uh, and uh, yeah, uh, obviously, you also have to be careful that uh, you occasionally select a research topic where you have a higher chance of getting uh, funded for this. Um, and uh, we were successful here. We were collaborating with, uh, or we are collaborating with Polish um, partners uh, so that the scheme opened from the German Research Foundation together with its uh, Polish um, um, partner. And so, uh, what the goal is obviously then. Um, on the one hand, almost a scientific one to understand uh, political processes to improve uh, the literature, our understanding, um, to provide uh, also encompassing systematic information on the sanctions. So it's more than an empirical kind of goal. And obviously, I'm a citizen uh, like everyone else. I also believe in enlightenment. And in this sense, I uh, hope that uh, my research can at least rationalize certain debates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do, do you feel that, that uh, um, because you're researching something that is actually not meta-theoretical framework or something, you're, you're studying empirical data that's out there that could um, immediately um, have an, an effect or an, an impact yeah. um, in, in policy advice or in, in policy measures. Do you feel um, being in academia now for uh, quite a while, as you said, um, that, that there is a gap between politics and academia in this way? Would you, um, or do you think that that there is a lot of communication um, between these two spheres? Uh, I mean, we have a lot less communication in political science and in international relations than, for instance, economists um, um, have, where you have certain ministries in every state uh, where economists, uh, for instance, uh, work and where also my colleagues are frequently consulted. The situation has somehow improved uh, in the sense that uh, 
quite certain departments, development agencies and so on, ask uh, for uh, our advice. Also international uh, agencies like the, the World Bank invest into conflict research and the prediction of violence because this is seen as a development uh, problem. So this uh, the situation has improved. But on, on the other hand, I would also like to say that um, you need to have a certain distance towards uh, the other side. I mean, we do academic work, we do basic research, we try to understand uh, processes, and uh, my contribution is not to uh, come up with uh, constantly with uh, political uh, advice. I mean, on another research project, I'm actually uh, examining how well um, experts um, work and whether we can trust uh, political experts or experts, at least media commentators in uh, the forecasts, in their forecasts about uh, political um, uh, events. And so we have to be careful. I hope that uh, the, the situation somehow improves, that they get to a similar status uh, mm -hmm. like in, uh, economics. Um, but simultaneously, we need to do our homework. We need to do basic research before we go to the press, before we try to preach uh, to politicians and the audience at, at large um, how the world should be run. Yeah, is, is that uh, so? So, are these two projects connected, or are they? Uh, do you work on a, on a broader? Out, they uh, come out of a, an early project I did in yeah. the two uh, thousands when I started to get an interest um, in financial markets and how political events um, find their repercussion on financial markets. Then I had the idea that you can use. Uh, financial markets as a predictive tool mm -hmm. um, and they're now uh, not the only one who has done so for the prediction um, of uh, political uh, violence. I mean there's an established tradition that you try to predict uh, election outcomes with financial markets uh, but sometimes uh, also with um, the forecasting um, markets. Um, so or prediction markets are they're also called. So I think this is uh, uh, one of the uh, contributions that I'm proud about to have at least played a little bit uh, a role in it um, in the 2000s that this is now something established and together with colleagues in uh, Sweden uh, we are actually now testing this uh, systematically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Gerhard Schneider. There was uh, definitely interesting insights into not only the topic that you present here, but also um, relates to your broader work. And I'm very happy that okay. all of us got this insight. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.